as our planet burns, a handful of beings are working to spread awareness of climate change and natural habitat destruction. My guest today is Maya Rose, an acclaimed author, ornithologist, and climate change activist. At the time of filming, Maya Rose was in her last year at Cambridge, and we went a few hours from Bristol to talk about birds, climate change, her complicated roots, and the issues facing our natural habitats. If you'd like a free copy of Maya Rose's book, let me know in the comments what you loved about her and her journey. This version of the conversation on YouTube is abridged, and the full hour-long episode can be found on all major podcasting platforms under Climate Story. Here's Maya Rose. But, but yeah, I mean, for people who don't have context, a big part of the story in Bird Girl is, is actually about your family. Yeah. And how you guys would get together and go birding. Is that the right word? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I, I think one of the weirdest parts about writing Bird Girl is because originally, actually, it wasn't a particularly personal book in that way. I love birds. I love nature. Yeah. Um, I wanted to write a book about all the amazing birds I've seen over the years. Yeah. And it was only as I sort of started to sketch this out that I realized that this was a story that made no sense without context. And that right. context was yeah. the fact that my mum was very mentally ill. She had very severe bipolar disorder. And my parents and I were turning to these big nature adventures to sort of cope with that and heal from that. Um, and sort of, I I went to my mum being like, I'm thinking about putting this stuff in. Are you comfortable with that? And I was terrified. And she was like, yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Um, and like, you've met my mum, so you, yeah. you can imagine exactly what it was like as well. No, your mom's amazing. And she yeah. was just like, I, I think you actually, I think this is a really important story to tell really honestly and really raw. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there are definitely probably moments in the book where any of us at any one point probably look terrible because that's the for nature sure. of like family. Yeah. Um, but for me, the most important thing was telling that story honestly. And it all came from birds. It always yeah. it always comes back to birds for me, hence Bird Girl. So, so what actually inspired you to write the book? Because it's pretty autobiographical, mm -hmm. right? And you are 21. I am, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit early to write it autobiography oh, absolutely, i mean you deserve yeah. it i mean you've done like amazing stuff no no whenever i talk about the book i try so hard to not use the word like memoir because it makes right. me feel so silly because right. i was 18 and 19 and i wrote it and that wasn't it it wasn't like i felt like i had some grand story of my life to tell it was more like i felt like i had a story yeah and that was what i've always loved writing and that was what i wanted to write about like it's not going to be in 20 years time. I go, yeah, time for Bird Girl Part 2. Yeah. Um, it's more like, for me, the idea of telling the story of a girl turning to nature and sort of, there's actually, there's a lot of stuff in the book about sort of growing up in the very sort of yeah. awkward teenage period and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And it just, it, I, I think that story to adulthood just felt like one that I wanted to tell. I have to say, like, you live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. I do. Like, Chew Valley is just phenomenal. Yeah. Did you actually appreciate it growing up or did you just think like this is what everywhere probably looks like? I think I probably didn't appreciate her as much as I should have in yeah. the way that you don't when you're a kid. For sure. Um, and I think as I got a bit older, I probably dreamed of like, you know, getting to the city and there being things to do and things like that. But I always, I think maybe because I have always had that love of nature, I have these moments of just like pure love maybe and it's like all these amazing childhood memories of just running around in fields or the woods or tracking down animals or looking for birds and all that sort of thing like yeah. it's, it was actually one of my favorite bits in the book to write was just all the very sort of beautiful childhood memories of living somewhere as amazing as that and I think also you know I had family in Bristol in the nearby city and like i you know, I wasn't oblivious to how other people were living. And I think because of that, I it did sort of foster this appreciation in me. Like, I've always known that I couldn't be a city girl. But but you have an equally strong side, which is your mom's side, which is Bangladeshi. Mm. And wh what's your connection to that side? Do you Because you didn't grow up there. You grew up here, right? I didn't. I'm actually, I'm third generation. My mom didn't grow up in Bangladesh either. My grandparents did. And they both moved to the UK when they were very young. And I think... Um, having a mixed identity is always a really weird thing. Um, like you're always trying to define yourself and I think other people are always doing that for you as well. And that I've always like made an effort to maintain that connection to my Bangladeshi culture, I guess. It's always been something that's been really important to me. But it's also been really difficult because I think through the generations, things slip away and traditions slip away. Um... But 
yeah, I, I try really hard and I, I always love going to Bangladesh, actually. It's, it's really special and I love my family that I have there, actually. I loved going there when I was a kid. It was always fun and exciting. You're definitely right that, like, Mumbai, Dhaka yeah. is very, very fast paced. Yeah, I can imagine, to, yeah. Uh, apart from if you're driving, actually, then it's very slow. But, um, you know, it, it, is, it is crazy in comparison. But it also, I, I write about this in the book, actually, sort of this battle of trying to figure out and define your own identity and kind of the contrast of that in the UK where I think like sort of figuring that out is so important and being able to tell people what you are is so important versus kind of going back to Bangladesh and people not caring about any of that and they're just like your family and your home and we're going to make you yeah. a crazy ginormous meal yeah. and make you meet everyone and yeah. you know it's it's a really nice contrast. There is something about that part of the world that just like fills your soul. You should almost come back tired, but you don't. Yeah, it's, I think both. Like, it, I think it's the warmth of it, you know? Yeah. Another difficult side of Bangladesh is obviously, like, the fashion industry. Yeah, and I think the fashion industry in Bangladesh is actually a really good example of why intersectional climate campaigning is so important. Because um, I guess in terms of this example, it's not as simple as in the West just going we need to stop buying fast fashion. This is terrible for the environment. You know, there are people working in terrible conditions in factories. Like this is just bad. We need to stop. Because without acknowledging the chain that all goes through, that's just cutting off a very big, very important industry that keeps a country's economy running. That is a massive employer for of sure. women actually is very, very important yeah. in terms of um, women getting money and jobs. And so instead, what you do is instead of just cutting that off, you go to Bangladesh and you think, how can we repurpose these jobs how can we repurpose these factories maybe we can turn them into places where they make solar panels maybe we can turn them into places where they recycle garments and turn them into whatever like there's loads of different options but that like in in order to have truly sustainable solutions to climate and environmental based issues we can't just cut things off like that we have right. to think about how to transform um our cultures and our economies to, to make it so that we can move forward with whatever that's transformed into. So so that side of you, I guess, is what brings out your empathy towards, um, you call them, uh, or, or us rather, you call us visual ethnic minorities. Is that your term for it? Uh, within the UK, within yeah. Within the UK, which yeah. But basically it's because... Like in America, they use the term people of color, yeah? Right. But people don't like that in the UK. I think for sure. the word color has different connotations. Right. And so for a long time, the term that people used was BAME, BAME, right. a black and Asian minority ethnic. But that was yeah. like a government census term. Yeah, that sounds awful. It felt very yeah. clinical. Yeah. It had no ring to it. People didn't like it. But also in terms of the work that I was doing specifically with my charity, Black to Nature, the people that we were working with felt like they couldn't go into green spaces because they were visibly different because they felt like they were going to be targeted. Um, they were going to be, you know, I don't know, sneered at or even like for some people there was a fear of hate crime. And the big thing was that they felt visibly different to the people who traditionally entered those spaces. And so it was just for the work specifically that Black to Nature did, we started talking about visibly minority ethnic children because that was our target audience. Those yeah. were the communities we wanted to work with. And that was always just supposed to be something for us. And the really nice thing is that for some people that has sort of, um, I, I suppose that's worked for them and lots of people have picked it up, which is lovely. You did a really interesting panel with Emma Watson. I did, yeah. Which was amazing. Um, how was that? How was she? Oh, she's lovely yeah. um, and weirdly normal. No, it was, <laughs> it was amazing actually. And it happened in such a weird way because she slid into my dms on instagram and no she was way. just like can we do something and i was like yes yeah um and that's every teenager's dream i, I know it was crazy <laughs> Wait, it was like, um so i met her and she was lovely and she also obviously cares very deeply about these issues and she brought together what i think i think the group that's called the climate justice league like Amazing. it was this group of women who she felt were doing really important work within the climate justice movement and um sorry within the climate change movement and we were all talking about climate justice um and 
It was really nice, actually, because there were some of us within the group who I definitely think just would not have gotten that platform otherwise. Right. Like, And then, you know, in contrast, you had people like Greta Thunberg and right. Be- Vanessa Nakate, who are, you know, very, very well known and sort of trying to use that prestige to lift other activists For sure. up. Yeah. Um, in particular, um, one of the women, she was called Vivi. Um, and she's fantastic. Um, but Vivi is from Colombia. And the crazy thing is she is so smart, actually. She has so much to say, but her first language is also Spanish. And even though it was a UN conference, they didn't pay for the translators. Oh and she had to fundraise and get donations from all over the world to even be heard at the, that UN conference. So and I sad. think that's very yeah. um, symbolic of the wider issue, I guess. Right, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the really lovely thing actually is about a month ago, we had a reunion uh, oh, of no that way. panel at the South Amazing. Bank Center. Yeah. Um, sans Emma Watson, because she is a very busy woman. But the rest of us yeah. got together and had just this fantastic conversation about what the future of climate should actually look like. And yeah. it, it, Anyway, I, they're amazing. And I'm very, very thankful for Emma to bring us all together. Yeah. Because um, it's just, yeah. So, wow. So you guys had a reunion and you got on stage again and was emma again leading the conversation unfortunately she could not she was going to zoom in and then i think possibly a un related um th- something right. that was like yeah. major enough that it was very much bigger yeah um but the rest of us um including greta got together um and had this really lovely conversation and yeah i think it was it was one of my favorite moments at cop the first time around actually was yeah. just meeting all of these people because i think for me superheroes for sure yeah exactly like genuinely though because I feel like sometimes doing environmental stuff is so miserable. <laughs> right. Because it feels like there's like 10 losses for every win. For sure. But for me, like meeting other campaigners and activists is kind of what makes, yeah. keeps me going a bit. And yeah, it's, it's like, amazing. you know, it's not just me or any anyone yeah. out there by themselves. There's like thousands of us. But for a long time, you did feel pretty isolated, right? I think so, yeah. And it doesn't help that these nasty trolls are constantly trying to pull you down. Yeah, especially, it's weird actually, as I've gotten older, they've sort of, dis- like, they're not as frequent, but when I was younger... They're scared of you. It was probably... <laughs> 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 um, um, but I think, like, the the big turning point, because you're right, for a long time it did kind of, I, it was just me, I was in secondary school, no one else at my school really cared about these kind of things. Yeah. Um, everyone else online was a lot old, like, it felt, not true, but it felt like everyone was older than me. Um... And then like it felt like the big turning point was when I was about 16, Youth Strikes for Climate sort of bursting onto the scene and Greta Thunberg. And suddenly it felt like it had gone from climate change being this really nerdy thing where everyone's like, why do you keep talking about this? To like, yeah, this is like the issue of a generation, you know? Um, And I think sort of having that solidarity with other people my age was, it felt amazing and it it was really important. What's your relationship with uh, Greta like? Um, I've met her quite a few times now, and she is in so so many ways so normal. Yeah. Um, like, which I think makes it scarier or more impressive in a way because she is not some kind of like figure. She is just like a a teenage girl. Um, and she's always really lovely, always down to have a laugh. Actually, um, and I think just. I enjoy chatting to her and just basically try as hard as I can to not be weird about it um, is basically what it comes down to. Yeah. yeah. There are so many places I've been that have just made me feel like the UK is stripped very bare. And in, and in right. some ways it is in that like the state of our biodiversity in the UK is terrible. We're one of the worst countries in the world in terms of biodiversity. That's shocking. Yeah, yeah and I think it's because we've been destroying our countryside for such a long time that we kind of do go like, oh yeah, the empty rolling fields with like sheep in, that's what countryside should look like. Right. It's very that's lush. Not, that's it's not like, alive, yeah. No, um, it's, you know, it's the equivalent of like having the endless green lawn in suburbia. Right. Um, yeah. You know, we need bog and forest and I don't yeah. know, marsh and all that kind of thing in order to have biodiversity. And those are all the things that we really don't like. And it's, 
fascinating going to other countries like Australia, but like many other places in in Asia and South America, where they just have untouched landscape and animals are just getting on with things as they have forever. <laughs> and it's just so different from here. It just makes me think of like, I don't know, the foxes rattling around in the <laughs> bins and the birds living under our eaves and all that kind of thing, you know? So, so in the book, you say that you were frustrated for many years because you felt like your message of conservation was just falling on deaf ears. And I think you even met like some prominent politicians, tried to convince them of, of your point of view, but never really felt like you mm. got anywhere. Yeah. Is that is that frustrating at times? Yeah, I think the nature of doing environmental campaigning is that it is just like endlessly frustrating and everything just works at a glacial pace as well. It's like change is always about 20 years behind where it should be. Um, understanding that the environment links to everything else. It's like if we don't look after our soil, we won't be able to go crops anymore. If we don't look after our forest, you know, like everything has economic governmental implications and because it wasn't immediate people didn't really seem to care and I think in the UK at least this is a big issue it's all this kind of short-termism where right. politicians or leaders are always thinking in terms of five-year bursts because that's how long they need to get re-elected yeah exactly yeah. I wanted to read a quick excerpt so for people that have the book it's page 222 uh as temperatures rise in the sea, fish stocks tend to move around and the once reliable destinations for food become depleted. Can you ex explain like the sort of cyclical link between climate change and natural habitat loss and how that's going to affect us in like the decades ahead? Yeah, I mean, I do personally think that biodiversity loss and climate change are two sides of the same coin. Right. And one of them does get a lot more attention than the other for, well, anyway, it doesn't really matter right, why, but climate change gets a lot more attention, maybe because it feels like it's going to affect people much sooner. I don't know. Right. Um, but yeah, they are intrinsically linked in so many different ways. Um, for example, you know, I mentioned earlier that we need more bogs in the UK, which is not a particularly exciting sentence. Yeah, exactly. um, the way that our landscapes once used to manage themselves um, is no longer tenable because of climate change. And we're, we're seeing that in like the terrible wildfires in Australia, for example. Right. Um, we're seeing that in, um, again, a, a lot of the flooding that we see is because of us destroying forests either side of a valley so it all like crashes down onto the village in the middle of the valley and you know there's lots of stuff like that and then a more simple example is birds time the hatching of their eggs in the spring to be as the same as the hatching of the caterpillar so that there's loads and loads of food but the caterpillars hatch by heat and the birds eggs hatch by timing and so suddenly the caterpillars are coming out two weeks before the chicks and there's not enough food. And you know, there's there's loads and loads of stuff like that going on where it's like everything is so finely tuned to run together. And as soon as one thing gets knocked slightly out of place, um, it just doesn't work anymore. Uh, yeah. Have you ever felt like a metaphysical experience or some sort of like spiritual experience while being in nature? I think quietly, yes, um, in that you can enter certain natural spaces and it feels very holy. Um, but I think, I think the weirdest experience I've had in terms of that was actually doing a activism stunt, like a campaigning thing. Um, Cause there's a picture of me that is I think very well known of me campaigning on the ice in the Arctic um, with the sign holding us a, a yeah. youth strike for climate sign and um, I think what people don't know is that I was out on that I was protesting I was out on that ice for hours probably five or six hours in the end and I was also by myself um, for for a very very long period of that and so it was just me sat on this ice you can feel the sea kind of moving beneath you there was kind of you could hear the ice melting around you and um 
I just felt incredibly connected to that landscape in that moment and also incredibly angry because of that I think and it was it was this very special almost spiritual moment but it was also really really upsetting um for sure maybe you maybe you are a meditator after all because <laughs> that's all we're really doing right True, we're, just, yeah. we're just switching off we're just like sitting in a funny way but <laughs> that's really all we're doing where can people find you online um, I'm super easy because my book is called Bird Girl and I am Bird Girl UK on everything. Um, and these days I'm probably the most active on Instagram and Twitter. So you can go and check me out. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was perfect. No, thank you so much for having me.